Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you all here. Welcome to another Sunday, and welcome back to the relevance of Revelation. Today, we're going to talk about the two witnesses, which is a fun topic. We're going to think about uh, you know, what is the meaning of this passage that we're going to look at in a moment. What does it have to do with salvation? What does it have to do with God's plan? Um, we can start with something like the Great Commission. And ask the question, will the Great Commission ever be fulfilled? Will, um, will all nations, will all the nations be given the gospel and baptized? When Jesus sends out his disciples, he says, baptize them. Uh, make disciples of all nations. Right? And we can say, well, will this ever be fulfilled? What, um, what would it look like for this to be fulfilled? How will this be fulfilled? How will the nations come to know the true God, to repent, and to know and love God. How will God accomplish this? And um, what does this have to do with Revelation? What is the church's role? And today, specifically, what is the role of the two witnesses in this, um, in this fulfilling of the Great Commission? Because that's what the story of the two witnesses is about. And we're going to talk about why are there two? What's the nature of their... Uh, why are they breathing fire? Um... You know, what's, what's going on with this? So how, how can it be that Babylon and Sodom and Gomorrah and Jerusalem and Rome and Egypt are all the same city? How's that possible? Right, when it says, oh, the city in which this happened was all these cities. And so we're going to talk about why this is in the story of the two witnesses. We'll start by looking at the passages. This account actually starts in Revelation 10 and 11. Um, and then continues in chapter 11. So the last verse, before 11, is after he opens the scroll. Remember, we talked about the scroll with seven seals. John opens the scroll, or God, the Lamb opens the scroll, and then the contents revealed to John. After he eats it, he internalizes the word, and then this is the message. And he said to me, you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And so John is being sent out as a prophet again, to prophesy. And I was given a reed like measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshippers. But do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. Now, this act of measuring, we're not going to talk a lot on this, there's no slides on this. But the act of measuring has to do with uh, the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel. Um, one of them, in one of those books, it's a restoration of the temple, and one of them is the destruction of the temple. And where he measures is different than, uh, than in those books, right? And so the point that's going on here with the measuring is um, part of the temple's preserved and part of the temple's destroyed. And so there's, um, there's a safe part, which is the inner, inner sanctuary, and then there's the part for the nations, which is trampled on. But the context here is restoring the temple. He continues, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshippers, but do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. And now I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the, the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouth, and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. So we have some interesting words here about the witnesses. We have uh, the time they will prophesy. We'll see this. We'll talk about that in detail and why the two lampstands, the two olive trees, and why fire comes from their mouth. And it continues, These witnesses have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall during the days of their prophecy and power to turn the waters into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. When the two witnesses have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will wage war with them and will overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the main street of the great city of Babylon, um, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was also crucified. And we know Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. So here we have all these cities. Well, what's, what's, what's the deal with the city? The great city is Babylon, 
But uh, it's also Sodom, it's also Egypt, and if you look through your Old Testament, you'll see um, that these cities have spiritually, spiritual significance, and so does Jerusalem, which has killed the prophets. And so they're following in this pattern. For three and a half days, all peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will view their bodies and will not permit them to be laid in the tomb. There's a whole history to this verse, too, in the Old Testament. Uh, we're not going to get into it much. But uh, it's a way of profoundly dishonoring someone to not bury them. And they will gloat. Those on the earth will dwell. Those who dwell on the earth will gloat over them and will send one another gifts because these two prophets had tormented them. Right? And this is, uh, this is an allusion to Saturnalia. How many here have ever heard of Saturnalia? Yeah, so Saturnalia is a gift, a Roman holiday that's uh, seven days. And um, you give gifts to each other. It's a reversal of um, a reversal of positions in life. And so, um, so poor people will act like kings, and rich people will serve poor people, and things like that. And it's a very festive time, but um, it's cut short. Right in the middle of the festivities, these guys wake up. So some sort of celebration, some sort of holiday, and uh, these guys have the breath of life from God enter into them, which is an allusion to Genesis. Um, you know, the, breath of, the breath of life with Adam you know, enters Adam. And this is also an allusion to Ezekiel when in the Valley of the Dry Bones when they're raised again. And, uh, and this is the middle of the celebration. They stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who saw them. And the witnesses heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched them. And in that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand were killed in the quake, and the rest feared God and gave glory to the God of heaven. So we see the outcome. So these are the verses related to the two witnesses, and we'll talk about them in a bit of detail here. Um, we can think about what does their story mean as a whole? What's the point of the story? Well, the story of the two witnesses dramatically symbolizes how the people of God, who have been redeemed from all nations, were told that this innumerable multitude from all nations is, uh, is related to this, this, um, you know, God's people and uh, the Redeemer from all nations. And here they bear prophetic witness to, to all nations. John is told to prophesy to all nations. And um, that's the role of the two witnesses. The witnesses, which is also the word for martyrs, remember the Greek word witness is also the same for martyrs, and um, this is the church in its faithful, prophetic, and self-sacrificial witness to Jesus in the world. The story of the two witnesses is the content of the scroll. The scroll is opened and uh, given to John once the last seal is opened, and this is, this is what is the content of the scroll. So this is important. Because this gives us God's plan, and we say, well, what is the point of uh, the two witnesses as it represents God's plan? And the point is that the faithful witness and death of the two martyrs is instrumental in the conversion of the world's nations, the ethnicities. This is the fulfilling of the Great Commission. Their victory is not simply salvation from a world that's doomed to go to hell in a handbasket, right? The world that is going to be destroyed and judged. That's not the point, is that uh, if you look at some of the judgments and you think about, okay, the 144,000, if you think about them, if, if you confuse them with some sort of Gnostic idea that uh, these are the people who are saved or raptured out of, out of the earth, rapture is not a concept that ever appears in Scripture in a good way, the people that are raptured are actually the bad people in scripture, scripture, even if you think of the word rapturus or harpizo, harpies, right, snatch them away to devour them. The people left behind are Noah and his family, who snatched away by the flood. Well, not the good people. So it's reverse rapture. If there's any rapture, the meek shall inherit the earth. We'll talk about misunderstandings of Revelation in one of the last classes. The point here is the 144,000 are not those who are raptured. Um, they're those that are sent to be witnesses, to be martyrs, and, uh, and they're marked. We talked about that a lot last week, if, uh, you, know, if you need uh, to remember that stuff. Uh, we went through it very, you know, very in detail, so we're not going to talk about it again. 
But the point here is the same with the two witnesses, that um, it has to do with bringing repentance to the nations on the earth. So they're sent out into the earth. God's kingdom is not to come about simply by saving an elect people from the world and extinguishing the rebels. It is to come through sacrificial witness of the people of God in the world, who by prophetically acknowledging God's rule in their lives through obedience... Right? The obedience is a key part. If you want to be a prophet, obey God's commandments. There is no prophet who does not obey God's commandments 100%. Uh, the early Christian church, you say, well, what's prophecy? Is that telling the future? Is that having a word of knowledge for God? No, that is not the essence of prophecy in Scripture in the early church. The essence of prophecy is to witness to God's word. And prophets do that dramatically. They do have a close relationship with God. But the point of prophecy is something very different. We'll talk about what prophecy is in Revelation and how it holds up this idea of bearing witness to Christ. Obedience is a huge part of that. But the point is, drawing rebellious nations to fear God, to repent, to acknowledge God's rule in their lives. Where do we get two witnesses from? Well, this is based on Zechariah. We talked about this before. In the context of the seven, the seven spirits, right? So this terminology of lampstands and spirits. Why are the churches lampstands? Uh, what's going on here? In Zechariah 4, the two olive trees of Zechariah's vision are said to be the two anointed ones, literally sons of oil, who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Historically, this is the high priest Joshua, and the governor of Zerubbabel, who are the folks who lead the post-exilic people back to the Holy Land, back to the Promised Land. So these, uh, these two figures are, in Zechariah and Haggai, explicitly said to be the two olive trees. So we say, okay, is this the return of this high priest Joshua and Zerubbabel? Is that what this means? Since we know they are the two, two olive trees, but... Um, Revelation is different, right? Revelation says they're two olive trees, but also says they're two lampstands. So we can say, well, where do we see the symbolism of lampstands? And if you remember when we talked about the churches, they're called lampstands. And so, okay, if we keep that symbolism consistent in Revelation, we're told that the churches are lampstands. And so if two lampstands are these two churches, some people think, okay, well, maybe it's two. Maybe it's two of the seven churches. Maybe, uh, maybe that's why. Maybe it's uh, you know, Pergamum and Smyrna. Maybe it's Ephesus. Maybe it's uh, you know, two of the faithful churches as opposed to the five who aren't faithful. But that breaks down if you try to make it work because there's faithful elements in all the churches. And uh, none of them are perfect. And we'll see why the number two in a moment, that's a very symbolic number, but we see in Revelation, the two olive trees are prophets anointed with the oil of the Spirit. In the early Christian church, there was this symbol. You can see it down here. Um, if you, can, you can see it kind of there. There's the, uh, the lampstand and the star of David and the Jesus fish, Jesus fish. Um, and all these are early artifacts that have this on it. Some of these are lamps, which is especially, uh, especially provocative to have this on a lamp. And with the inscription... Uh, of the of the spirit for the oil in Aramaic or for the oil of the spirit is how it reads and this is an early Christian understanding of being anointed by the oil of the spirit that the church is is the group anointed by the oil of the spirit and we see this from Revelation this is a symbol that comes from Revelation what's called the messianic seal and the point is that the church is anointed with the oil of the spirit and in the same way these two Olive trees, prophets, right? And we, we can say, why two? Why two lampstands? Why two? Um, they're equated with the two lampstands, which are churches. And we can say, okay, well, these two witnesses are lampstands bearing the lamps, the light of the flames of the, of the seven spirits. We talked about the seven churches bearing the seven flames, and these are bearing the flames of the Holy Spirit. But we can say, okay, well, why lampstands? Um, the answer to that is churches. They're churches. But uh, we say, okay, well, okay, the two witnesses are identified as lampstands, the symbol of the church is in chapter 1. And we say, okay, what 
does the symbolism in chapter 1 represent? And we saw that had to do with the prophetic witness of the Spirit. So this somehow relates to the prophetic witness of the Spirit. But why are they only two, right? That they're only two doesn't mean that they're only part of the church. And two is a very significant number, especially when we're talking about witnesses. So any, any Jew, good just because any good Jew, any good Jew or a bad Jew, it doesn't matter whether you're good or bad Jew, you hear the phrase two witnesses and your ears perk up. Right? His two witnesses has a very deep history within Judaism. This has to do with the testimony that's acceptable. If you have one witness, you might say, huh, maybe that's not the whole story. But another witness comes along, substantiates the story, and then you have something that needs to be taken seriously. This is the minimum number for credible witnesses. And you find rabbis at this time writing, if you have two witnesses, who come separately, then their testimony is as powerful as a hundred witnesses. So you have statements like that. They need to be taken as seriously as a hundred witnesses. And so this is the minimum number of witnesses. As long as there's two remaining faithful, then the church remains faithful, right? Those two witnesses is, um, is the faithful remnant. Those who testify, those who bear witness. And it's enough. The point is, two is enough and two is sufficient. Two witnesses is a very, very ancient Jewish idea. All right, so this idea of two, and especially two witnesses. Why two witnesses? Um, and in this way, they're the church insofar as it fulfills its role as a faithful witness. Even if there's not a lot of witnesses, two is sufficient. Right? Uh, Jesus says, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am with you. So this idea... Uh, of a minimal community, Adam and Eve, right? This idea of two witnesses goes back to Adam and Eve. Why one, one alone isn't, isn't sufficient, but two, two is all you need for a sufficient witness. As witnesses, which is also the word for martyrs, they're also prophets. We're told that in Revelation 11, 3, and 10. And uh, we're told in 19, 10 that witness for Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So if you want to know what true prophecy is, John tells us it's the witness to or of um, or for, martyrdom for, witness of, Jesus, um, is the spirit of prophecy. So we can say more about these two witnesses. If we look at their powers, these are the powers of Elijah and Moses. Uh, the power to shut up the rains, to stop it from raining, to uh, get, send plagues, to turn water into blood. These are all uh, powers associated with these two prophets. And these two prophets are often seen as the, the summary, if you're going to summarize the Old Testament prophetic tradition. Elijah and Moses were often used as a summary. Sometimes uh, Moses is seen as the law and Elijah is seen as the prophets. So it represents the whole Old Testament, and we see this in some stained glass windows. We also, interestingly enough, find these two guys. Um, you know where we find them in the New Testament? Let me ask you that. Wake you up a little bit. And remember where we see these two guys in the story of Jesus? Transfiguration. Yes, transfiguration. So Jesus, they're having a conversation with them. He says, you know, the disciples are like, hey, this is really good. Uh, I like this. This is cool, you know. Like the two big guys come and well, they have, you know, well, in tradition, Elijah, Elijah never dies, and some people thought Moses never died either, uh, since his body was never found. Uh, so there's some ideas there, but the idea is these are these are the two big prophets. So they're a model. They're a model for these two witnesses. Um, we're never told that they are Moses and Elijah, right? And so that's never, never fully, uh, you know, some people say, okay, Moses and Elijah will come back. You know, Elijah never died, but Moses will come back from the dead if he was dead in, in the end times. But scripture doesn't tell us that. And that's not the point. They're modeled on them. And they set the precedent for the church's prophetic witness in the world. Right? These are the prophets who challenged the idolatry of the world. These are the prophets who challenged the ways of culture that were against the will of God. And they prophesied for 1,260 days. That's 42 months, which is um, the same amount of time that we read that the nations will trample 
on the sanctuary. So it's interesting, John gives us different ways of calculating the same amount of time. This is also three and a half years, which goes back to the Great Tribulation in Daniel. Last week we learned that Great Tribulation is a technical term at the time of John for the Messianic War. Right? And so we say, okay, so the nation, so this whole thing, right, what John is talking about here is what we've actually talked about last week. This same period of time from Daniel, the Great Tribulation, is the Messianic War that we went into a lot of detail about last week when we talked about the 144,000 who are equated to the great multitude and the idea of the lion and the lamb. The Great Tribulation is the Messianic War. The people who fight in that Messianic War are the 144,000 of the Lion of Judah and the countless from many nations and the, you know, the 144,000 are exclusively men who are virgins from Israel. So if you think you're one of the 144,000, unless you're a man of military fighting age who's a virgin from Israel, you are not one of the 144,000. I'm sorry to bear this news to you. But that's not the point. That's, if you read it literally, that's where you get. But if you see that he hears 144,000, and he hears this about them, and he sees an innumerable multitude, and the lamb who was slain, the same hearing versus seeing, then you realize, oh, I'm part of that, insofar as I'm a faithful witness, bearing testimony to the blood of the lamb, and living in the power of that blood. These are the same thing, this 144,000, the countless multitude. We talked a lot about that last week. The beasts and the nations wage war against these entities. They also wage war against the two witnesses. Right? These are all different ways of talking about God's church. If you pay close attention to what's going on and you try to make Revelation consistent, you'll see that John is talking about the church in different ways, using different parables, different models. Right? The church plays a role as the martyr, it plays the role as the messianic army, and here it's playing a role as prophetic witness modeled on Elijah and Moses and Jesus because Jesus is the ultimate prophet so these two witnesses are also modeled on Jesus fire from their mouths now these literally fire breathing prophets uh, some movies portray them that way if you do an image search for two witnesses you know, you'll see images with, uh, you know, from modern movies with them literally breathing fire where else do we find people breathing fire in scripture? Well, uh, Jeremiah breathes fire. I don't know if you knew that about him. But, um, but again, prophets. God says to Jeremiah, I am now making my words in your mouth a fire. And this people would, and the fire shall devour them. We find this language all over the Old Testament with different prophets. We find this with Elijah, right, whose word is said to be a burning torch that would burn the people. Um, this is prophetic language for the Word of God. Right? So this is how the Word of God is talked about in the prophets. John knows this because he knows the Old Testament. This also comes into contemporary apocalyptic literature. Um, the Messiah is in 4th Ezra. This is a book that's in the, you know, the, the Apocrypha, as Protestants call it, the Deuterocanon, as Catholics call it. But this 4th Ezra um, has the Messiah. This is a contemporary document that has the Messiah Breathing fire, which signifies his power to confront people with God's words. The same imagery is being used here for these two prophets. This is powerful. God's word is like a flame, a torch, uh, you know, breathing fire from your mouth. It devours people, and we have other people that things come out of their mouths. Right? We have the dragon and the beast and the false prophet who emit frogs from their mouths, or frog spirits, how, you know, what are frogs? What's the deal with that? Well, if you ever try to catch a frog, they're slippery. Frogs symbolize lies, right? Slippery speech. Slippery speech that turns people away from God, right? You know, serpentine speech, right? So the idea here is speech that consumes and burns you to the heart versus speech that, oh, I can't quite get a hold of a lie. Right? So there's a war of words going on here in the imagery. 
And that's, you know, if anything else, don't miss the symbolic imagery, the prophetic imagery. If you want to take it literally in the sense that fire-breathing prophets and, and uh, beasts with frogs spewing out of their mouths, um, you're welcome to. But you're going to miss the point. You're going to miss the point if you miss the prophetic word at the core. If anyone wants to hurt them, they must be killed in this way. This is interesting. This means that um, anyone who confronts them is, is not going to get away unscathed. Right? Um, the opponents are overcome by their speech, whether or not they're actually dead. You know, we can think about that. Uh, because there is a sense of overcome or devoured, so the same language of being killed or slayed by the word. Right? We still, we, you know, he was slain in the spirit. Oh, well, we should call coroner. Because uh, that can't be good, right? Someone's dead from the Holy Spirit. You ever hear the phrase slain in the spirit? Right? We still use this language. Um, so this is, this is, Scripture uses this language too. Right? They will be slain in this way. Opponents are overcome by the prophet's speech. Symmetry and judgment, those who want to hurt the witnesses find uh, they're dealing with more than they can handle. These are, when these witnesses are doing their work, they are convicting. And uh, we'll see what their work is in a second, but their power, interestingly, is defensive. They don't go on the offensive. They speak when people confront them, right? And it's interesting that their power is also limited in scope because they eventually do end up dead, Right? Uh, they do end up slain by the beast. And uh, their, their death is a victory in heaven, though the beast thinks it's a victory. Right? The beast thinks it's victorious when it kills them. Uh, but in heaven, we see that they're actually victorious in heaven. So there's two different perspectives going on here, too. They're martyred. Martyrdom was understood to be the fate of the Old Testament prophets and the expected fate of any true prophet. Any true prophet was expected to be martyred, especially at this time. Lots of stories about the martyrdom of prophets. Um, Elijah, right? Elijah is an interesting, interesting uh, you know, not, not all prophets literally died, but that was kind of the idea. And witness and prophecy is the same. Uh, witness and, and martyrdom is the same word in Greek. The Revelation 11.8 shows that the principal precedent for the death of the two witnesses is that of Jesus. They're killed. We're told that uh, they're killed in the city when Jesus was killed. And so there's a connection with Jesus there. And um, also that they're raised again after three and a half days, which, um, which is a prophetic way of talking about um, when Jesus was raised. So, so often prophets would add a half day to things, but that's also connected to the three and a half times. So John is connecting the resurrection of Jesus with the great tribulation, um, and many other things with this three and a half number. It's a very complicated prophetic number, but it connects to Jesus. The two witnesses continue the witness of Jesus himself. Their death is a participation in the blood of the Lamb. Witnessing consists in obedience to God's commandments. Revelation makes this explicit. Uh, and the consequences martyrdom. If you obey God's commandments, if you're obedient to God, if you bear faithful witness, you should expect to die, and Jesus calls us to death, whether it's a living death, dying to ourselves every day by taking up our cross, or in a heroic act of self-sacrifice, giving ourselves over for the sake of our faith. Right? Both of these are different types of death, and this is obedience. Right? All who bear faith and witness to Jesus, or for Jesus through obedience, are true prophets. Um, in 11.3, where the faithful church and its witness to the world is portrayed under the image of my two witnesses who prophesy, prophecy and witness are equated. So this idea of witness is very connected to the idea of prophecy. And this is, this is the world of Revelation. This is the world of the early church. And how do they witness? What is the essence of their witness? Well, we get a sense of that by the fact that they're dressed in sackcloth. So sackcloth was... Dark goat's hair, not very comfortable. But uh, the point is that uh, it was a symbol of repentance and grief over sin, right? It also was accompanied by prayers of confession and pleas for mercy. And so the prophets who wear sackcloth are pleading, asking God to not judge. They're saying, just give more time for repentance before the judgment. Uh, and they're trying to make people feel sad about their sins, 
to grieve over their sins. So the symbolic import of sackcloth is these are prophets who somehow, through their ministry, are convicting people as to the nature of their sins, as to the sorrow um, that they should feel for the injustices, for the evils, for all the wrongs. Confronted with a world addicted to idolatry, lust, greed, and so many other evils. We're talking about the specific... John has a whole category of evils. He actually has a very potent economic critique of empires in there, which includes slavery, and includes cosmetics, and includes uh, luxury items, and includes luxury foods. And he, you know, most commentators just ignore his long list of critiques, and, and this is one of the most potent parts of the book. But um, confronted with a world that's addicted to these things, these two prophets, right, the two witnesses, the two uh, the church, bearing truth to the world, proclaim one true God and his coming judgment on evil, but they do so not as a self-righteous, not as a I'm better than you sort of message, but as a sackcloth, dressed in sackcloth, called to repentance. So there's a deep humility in sackcloth that these witnesses represent. And uh, we say, okay, and these are supposed to be the paradigm. These are the paradigm, right? In the context of the imagery of Revelation, these are the faithful church. And two, right, the two witnesses, again, is this Jewish idea that two is enough. So what happens? Well, once their witness is seen, it's not refuted even by their death. But they're vindicated. They're brought to life again. And uh, earthquakes throughout Scripture are, are signs of God's presence. Earthquakes are vindications of prophets. Jesus as a prophet is vindicated by an earthquake. Um, at least in one of the Gospels. And so earthquakes have to do with vindication. right? And so this earthquake, which is also a judgment, it's a, at the same time a vindication, so they're brought back to life, and they're vindicated by an earthquake, and all those who see genuinely repent and acknowledge the one true God. After the earth, earthquake, which accompanies the vindication of the witnesses, the rest, the Greek word ho lo, loipoi, right, so, fear God and give him glory. So we find that they're actually effective. And this is interesting because we have all these other judgments and um, in other places we read that uh, like in Revelation 9, 20, 21, 16, 9, 9 through 11, we have judgments and then the rest we're told do not repent. All these people perished but the rest did not repent. So John saying, okay, all these judgments, and we talked about the judgments with the scroll, but it didn't lead to repentance. But here is the first place we find people repented. The rest repented. And um, the description of the rest corresponds to the invitation of the angel who calls on all nations to acknowledge God. And so this is the same terminology being used. Um, the angel is calling on people to acknowledge God. And the work of the witnesses leads people to this place. This is a remarkably positive result, and to get how positive it is, we have to look again at the Old Testament to see uh, other cases which use the same symbolic arithmetic, which is a phrase that some commentators use, and I like that. Revelation has a lot of symbolic arithmetic. Um, it be fun to major in that in college. I'm majoring in symbolic arithmetic. Right? It's a branch of mathematics, prophetic arithmetic. Um, why? Well, in the judgments announced by the Old Testament prophets, often a tenth part of the city, and often there would be 70,000 people in the city, which is, which is a, uh, you know, often a symbolic number, too. Um, so a tenth part would be 7,000, and these are the ones who would typically repent or give glory to God while the rest would be destroyed. So you look through many cases of other prophets, and you find, okay... A tenth gives glory to God. Seven thousand give glory to God. And the rest perish. Right? So what's interesting about Revelation is that um, we find something different. Right? This is specifically or effect, especially related to Elijah's ministry. Right? Seven thousand alludes to the effect of Elijah's ministry, which seemed to be a really great result. Right, uh, seven thousand spared. That's very positive. Elijah was a great prophet, 
Right? So we have uh, the rest killed, but 7,000 are spared because they give glory to God. But John reverses these numbers. He takes these numbers that are all throughout the Old Testament and reverses them. Instead, we find that the two witnesses bring conversion of all except the 7,000. So 7,000 perish, and the rest are the ones who give glory to God and repent. Right? So John is saying, well, these, you have all these Old Testament prophets, and they gave good results. But look at these two witnesses. The results of these two witnesses are so much more, so much more than those in the Old Testament. So the two witnesses, only a tenth suffer the judgment, and the remnant or the rest are spared. The nine-tenths come to fear God. This is not the faithful minority, but the faithless majority are the ones who repent and come to God. Right? Thanks to the witness of the witnesses, the judgment actually leads to salvation. So a lot of people miss this. I don't know how they miss this. Maybe, maybe they're obsessed with the idea of um, the world being judged and uh, destroyed. And so you think, okay, well, what's going on? What are these cities? Well, the city is every city. right? When, when John says, yes, this is Babylon, but yet, this is also Sodom, and Egypt, and Jerusalem. And these are all places in, in Scripture that we see there's a struggle. My Babylon is the city of exile, a city of great sin. Egypt is also a city of great idolatry, right? And slavery, right? Egypt always represents slavery in the deep sense of the story of Exodus, especially when you're talking about Moses and his role in Pharaoh, and Jerusalem, Jerusalem is the city that breaks God's heart over and over and over and over again. Sodom, city of great luxury and great sin. And so all these cities represent every city, every city that is opposed to God's will. And so in 70,000, right, you say, okay, well, that's, that's a number. Well, this is, this is the complete number. Right? This is everyone, in every city, in every time, in every place, in every place that we does not receive God, resists his will. Right? These witnesses are present, doing their work. These witnesses are the church. These witnesses are you and me, when we're faithful to God's word and obedient to his will. And it has an effect, right? Their story is a calling and a parable. Right? It's a call to arms, but it's, a, it's an interesting sort of arms. It's the same arms of 144,000. Who is the Messianic army? Well, they're the, they're the great multitude that lay down their lives for a friend, that love their enemy, that pray for them who persecute them. Right. This, is, this is how it's done. This is the church faithful witness. The story dramatizes what will be happening all the time when Christians bear faithful witness to the world. The role of Christians as God's eschatological people living in the reality of God's future promises, that's eschatological, right? Living, knowing that the second coming of Christ is a fact, and that Christ is present now, and that God's redeeming the world. Right? This is not this is not a story that's just in the future. This is a story that's also in the present and also in the past. That's why John is using all these images to connect them, right? So so we're not tempted to say, oh. Why well, can just sit back and wait for the end time scenario to happen? All I have to do is just um, hang out and do nothing until Christ comes back. Right? That is not an option for John, not for Revelation. The role of Christians as God's eschatological people is to be the witnesses who will bring the nations to faith in the one true God. The witness of Christ's obedient servants participates in the power of his blood when they too are faithful witnesses, even unto death. The two martyrs, or witnesses, like all martyrs, right? they are martyrs, right? they're slain, are effective witnesses to the truth of the gospel. Because their faith in Christ's victory over death is so convincingly evident in the way they willingly face death. Right? They are not afraid of death. They know who holds the key to Hades. They know that death is something that is uh, just in this world. But if you lift the veil... Right? That's the, the apocalypse. It's literally lifting the veil. 
You see beyond. You reveal revelation, what's true. You see that there's a much bigger picture at work. So as they live, they testify to a faith and truth even deeper than death. This is, um, this is you know, Jesus talks about, you know, unless you're even willing to hate life, and you can't be my disciple, right? It's this idea to hate your own life. This means to treat it like it's secondary because you know what's primary. This idea of, well, yeah, that person seems like they hate their life. They seem like they have a death wish. Um, if that's the nature of your ministry, that you are dying to self, well, then, then you are acting like these two witnesses, right? This, uh, the faithful witnesses. And this is, this is the deep theme of Revelation, right? This is what John wants to tell us. He wants to say, yeah, live like these two, these two lampstands. Be this type of church, because they are lampstands, they are churches. But um, there's a lot going on. It's not going to be easy. It's part of the story, too, right? Uh, don't think that you're going to uh, be able to cling, cling to this life and cling to Christ at the same time. Right. So this is the story of the two witnesses. Again, a lot more can be said about them. Um, you know, every symbol. I mean, this is just a handful of verses, and uh, not even a whole chapter. But there's so much in here. This is just scratching the surface. So, but hopefully, we'll have a better sense of who they are. But we can take them and their witness back into our lives. As I'm reflecting on them, you know, yesterday I was taking a walk, and you know, I'm looking out over the bay. I was thinking, what's the greatest risk that I've ever taken for the sake of my witness to Christ? And I was thinking about, um, you know, conversations I've heard. People say, eh, you know, I don't want to post on Facebook because I don't want people to know I'm a Christian. Or people at work don't know I'm a Christian. And then so, you know, every once in a while I hear someone say, yeah, you know, I told some people at my work that I'm a Christian. Or I decided to post something about my faith and how God touched me on Facebook. And I lost five friends, you know. And um, you you say, well, what's the biggest risk you've ever taken that you can think of? Or are you a little risk? Think about risk-taking for the sake of your faith, for the sake of your witness. And um, and let's share in our groups, you know, about those stories. I think there's some good stories that we can inspire each other and convict each other. If you you think, yeah, you know, I didn't take a risk. I wish I could sacrifice more for Christ's witness in my life. So think about those areas too. What areas of your life do you wish you could sacrifice more for the sake of Christ's witness? Maybe maybe, um, maybe you want to tell some people. Maybe your family doesn't know you're Christian. Maybe there's others in your life who feel, I should talk to a neighbor. I should... Um, or maybe it's something. I need to give something up. I need, I need to stop doing something that is killing my witness in my life. Think about those things that stop you as stumbling blocks, right? What are the stumbling blocks that get in the way of your sacrificial witness? Right? So three questions, they're all related. Think about your good moments, your good, you know, yes, you know, there's a time, you know, I literally risked my life to preach the gospel, you know, with, uh, you know, a hundred Muslims surrounding me who were going to kill me, you know. Um, and I ran out of that mosque, you know, as after I preached the gospel and that felt good because I didn't care about my life. You know, if that's your story, great. Uh, if it's, I shared a Facebook post, great. Right? But think about these moments. What areas of your life do you wish you could sacrifice more for the sake of your witness to Christ? You know, where are your growing areas that you want to sacrifice, that you want to be self-sacrificial and what gets in the way? Three questions. Let's uh, you know, start with Ten minutes on these questions, and we gather, and, um, and we'll see how the conversation goes. Try to get in groups of five, ideally. Um, if there's six or four, that's okay too. And then we'll re-